Sporting dog adventures run, that boy, run. That was awesome. Everything you Good need boy. is here. here under the sun. Everything you need is here under the sun. The Sporting Dog Adventures podcast is proudly brought to you by Saki Acres Retrievers. Whether you're looking for a black, yellow, or chocolate Labrador Retriever puppy, please check out our website for more information at www.sakiacres.com. You can also email Jeff at sportingdogtv at gmail.com or call 262-215-9683. And remember, everyone deserves a Saki Dog. Hey, I'm Jeff Fuller. Welcome to the Sporting Dog Adventures podcast. We're here today. We've got a great show for you. It was an emotional show last week as we talked about the loss of my youngest uh, boy, Callahan. Um, this week, I had a topic that uh, came up several times as we've got a bunch of puppies to go home. So I wanted to kind of give some insight on it. And that is, does the size of a puppy equal a large adult or small adult? Can you go by that gauge of the size of the puppy? The second part of our show will be, I'm going to go through all three weeks of our obedience program. We had started doing this in the past. I obviously got sidetracked losing Cal, so we missed the third week. I thought we would just do a recap on the other two weeks and go into the third week. And then on the last part of the show, I wanted to talk about yet another fun hunt I had with Callahan and Clayton in the field when we were filming the TV show, Sporting Dog Adventures. So hope you guys enjoyed today's show. It should be a good one. And we will start out with, does the size of a puppy equate a large adult dog? This is something that I hear often. People will make the comment that you oft, that you always hear, which is, my gosh, look at the size of that puppy's feet. That puppy is going to be a 150-pound lap. Or those are giant puppies. That is going to be a big dog. How do we predict the size of a dog? And it comes down to, honestly, genetics. It's really, really easy, guys. Look at the size of the parents. You're not going to have a dog that is at a proper weight that will be 30 to 40% larger than the parents. So when we look at this, why would puppies be big? Well, when it comes down to it, I can talk about my own kennel. When I was first doing dog breeding, you start out, you do the best you can, you will struggle with certain things and you will learn through vets and through experience. My puppies went home, I would say on average about eight pounds. So you're looking at an eight pound puppy at seven weeks old, not a bad size, but they would go home at that size. Whereas now through nutrition and supplements, our puppies go home at about an average of about 14 pounds. Why is that? We have them on worming protocols. We have them on a pipe powder called Phytovite. And this nutrition gives these puppies a healthier GI tract. We also have our females on a certain protocol when they are throughout one throughout their pregnancy, but two, when they come in for the last 10 days, we put them on a certain protocol and all of these, th these things help to foster a healthier puppy pre-birth and then a healthier puppy post-birth. So we end up with a puppy that is probably I'd say 40% larger than the puppies we had been putting out. Does that mean that these dogs are going to be larger? Absolutely not because the moms are still 50 to 60 pounds. The dads are still 65 to 75 pounds, which is about the size that we had back when our puppies were eight pounds. They're going to mimic their adult sizes of the parents when they reach full adulthood. Often I will get the people that will bring up the comments of my last dog was a big dog, big, big, oh, 120 pound dog. What we're seeing on probably 90% of the folks with these dogs. Some dogs are large, but I've had people tell me that my own dogs are in that big dog, muscular dog stage. What we're seeing is the humanization of a dog's weight. By that, I mean, we're looking at a dog. We don't see a big belly hanging over like we do with people. 
and dogs when they gain weight they get wider so we think of it as muscle but it's actually layers of blubber dogs will gain width as they get older they will lose that hourglass shape as they get fatter or as they'll gain the width too and it is just something where the dog is not muscular like when i look down and i struggle to see my toes it doesn't mean that i have strong abs it means that I need to yet again, go on another diet. Dogs are the same thing. But the problem that we have is when our dogs are 10 or 20 pounds overweight, we humanize that weight. We think, well, it's only 10 pounds or it's only 20 pounds. My gosh, you know, I am 30 pounds overweight. That's not that much. We need to stop looking at the actual weight number and think of it in terms of a percentage. If you have a 50 pound dog that is five pounds overweight, that is 10%. Our dog Memphis is 50 pounds. Many people would have a dog like Memphis and she would probably be 65 pounds. That would be a dog that is 30 pounds overweight. To give you an idea, that is 60 more pounds on my body. It is not only bad for the dog's joints, but overall health. When we look at health and we look at bodies that are battling everything from cancer to illnesses, the heavier our bodies are, the more strain it is the more chance there is to have these health issues show up. So keep your dogs at a good weight. Realize that just because a puppy is big and has big feet or is a chubby puppy doesn't mean that they should be that when they get older. Everyone loves a fat puppy. We got to keep them at a good weight too, because ultimately it comes down to you want to make sure that they're in a good position as they grow and they're in a good position health-wise throughout their life so we get more longevity out of our dogs. Find out when you get a dog what the parent's weight is when they're at an optimal weight. And by optimal weight, I mean hourglass look. You can rub their sides, feel their rib. I shoot for being able to barely see the last rib on the dog uh, when they're just standing. Have them at that weight. Find out what that weight is, and that will give you a gauge on what size your dog should be. Now, there's always going to be a difference between male and female. Our females here at Soggy Acres Retrievers run 50 to 60 pounds. Our males are in that 65 to 75 pound range. So keep in mind that your males are going to be 10 to 15 pounds larger and that a female out of that breeding, if it takes more after daddy as opposed to mommy, could be a little bit heavier, but it's not going to be 20 pounds. It's not going to even be 10 pounds. You're going to be probably shooting for within the same weight of the mom if it's a female or five pounds plus, or if it's a larger female bred to a male that is let's say 65 pounds you're going to be looking at the size of the male five or ten pounds plus max once we start looking at it that way we're going to have healthier dogs we're going to have dogs that have more longevity we're going to get more time in the field whether it's taking them out hiking playing or hunting or running competition so i hope this part of the show helps you next up we're going to talk about our three-week obedience course we'll go through week one and two that we've covered in past podcasts and then we'll go a little bit more in depth into week three. And then we are going to talk about an upland hunt that I filmed with my sons, Clayton and Callahan. Uh, gosh, that was back in season eight of the show. Wonderful hunt and a fun time. We'll have all that and more coming up after this. Welcome to Boucher in Janesville, where customer service is our number one priority. Our customers come back to us because of the experience that we provide for them. We are here to make sure that we find you the right car, one that fits your budget, and do so in a timely manner. When we say we ride with you every mile, it means we care about you and how you are treated. Estamos con personal que habla español en los departamentos de servicio y venta. Our certified technicians are here to help you with all your service needs. Visit us today at Boucher.com. At Boucher, we ride with you every mile. It's Jeff Fuller from the Sporting Dog Adventures podcast, and I need a little help. Please stop what you're doing and give us a five-star rating. Follow us on the platform you're on. Give us a thumbs up. And above all, share our podcast with your friends and family. Our podcast will grow even more, and we can get more people involved in the sport we love with dogs in the field.
Hey, welcome back to the show. We want to go through our three-week course on obedience. We've done these prior, but there's been a little bit of a time lapse. So I figured we would kind of go through what we worked on in week one, what we worked on week two, and then a little more in depth on week three. So with our training tip today, we're going to talk about doing our obedience training. This is a formal three-week course that I do here at, the, at, at our kennel side, Yeager's Retrievers. And it is taking a dog basically that is being non-compliant because people are struggling. That's why they brought them here, working with them through their obedience until finally, after three weeks, they're on an e-collar and they're off lead. So we start on week one with a dog and we work them on sit, hear, heel, and kennel. We have a prong collar on the dog and we also put a dummy collar or a collar that is not turned on for an electrical collar on the dog when we take them out. I hear the same thing. People will bring their dogs in for obedience and say, my dog is great on all those commands. And it's like, if your dog was great on those commands, you wouldn't be here. I have to work with them to get them to my standard on that. And then we will, we will progress from there. And I'm going to explain everything on take home so that you understand where your dog needs to be. So we start on the command of heel, sit, and hear as we're taking the dog for a walk. We've got a prong collar on. What is usually the point is, or the problem is the dog is like flying a kite, which is they're all over the place. They don't want to heel. They want to tug. They want to pull. And the beauty of the prong collar is as they lurch and pull and yank on you, they're giving themselves pressure with the collar. They're actually, what I explain to people is they're kicking their own butt and they're putting this pressure on their neck and dogs are very smart. If you use this and take them out for a walk for 10 minutes and you don't just kind of tug them and beg them to do it, you just let them, if they lunge out, pull back and tell them no heel or if they're dragging behind, pull on it, give a couple, like three short pulls and tell them here. They don't sit, you pull up on it and tell them to sit. Within a day or two, they understand that they have to comply because again, they're kicking their own butt with this collar. We also have the e-collar on because we're gonna do something called collar conditioning later. And we wanna make sure that they don't think that the e-collar has anything to do with training other than it's just something that they have on. So we work with them on this first week. We get them so they're compliant, so they walk properly at heel. Heel is where their shoulder is equal to your knees you're walking. They sit immediately when, when you're told to sit. And that doesn't mean that they kick around and slowly sit. It's that you tell them sit and boom, they hit their butt because they think they're gonna get uh, the, the collar pulled up on them and, and cause pressure. And then we use the here command, which is where we do a remote sit out in front of you, tell the dog here and pull them toward you so they understand that if they go toward you, there's no pull on the collar. We get through, we teach that, we work them in the kennel, we tell them kennel, which is step into the kennel, and I tell them to kennel, and if they don't come in, I pull them uh, on the collar and bring them in. They understand what all these commands are. They understand that there is a negative response for non-compliance that they are going to actually get corrected by the collar because of their misdeeds. And the key of this is we need to teach the commands. They need to understand the commands. Now you also need to give 90% praise. So again, if you've got 10% negative and on the first few days, there's a lot of negative. You're going to give commands. How do we do that? We give the commands. We're going to give 90% praise. It's when a dog is walking at heel, you constantly are talking to them. Heel, good dog. Heel, good dog. Heel, good. Heel, good dog. Sit, good dog. Sit. Good dog over and over because when the dog doesn't do these commands, you're going to correct them. Here, good dog, good. Keep in mind that positive reinforcement is not what we say. Yes, it is in a, in a way, but it's how you say it because we're looking at voice inflection and body language. So as guys, we're terrible at praise. Good dog, good. That sounds like you're mad at the dog. Good dog, good. Dogs are conditioned that they see your body language and voice inflection, and they get the praise that way. Having your arms crossed and standing completely straight up is bad posture for a dog if you're given positive. Bend over slightly at the waist, have your hands down, pet the dog, give them that positive body language, the positive voice inflection, and give it over and over and over again so that when you do give negative, it makes the dogs realize they have a real choice here. They're going to get negative if they don't do it, but they get overwhelmed positive if they do. So as we work with these commands in the first week, we then work to week two. Week two, we're going to turn the collar on. We're going to take the dog for a walk. And every 
third or fourth time that we tell a dog to sit, we're going to say sit and also use the collar. Now, take a step back quick. When you're putting a collar on a dog, we want to see what level they work at. You're going to sit the dog. You're going to basically not give them a command and just push the button. If the dog kind of jolts a little bit or looks around, that is where you start because that is where the dog can feel the correction. Again, these corrections are not electrocutions. We call them shock collars. These collars are the same collars that people use for underground fences in their yards. That is always a misnomer. Everyone talks about how terrible shock collars are and they still have an underground fence for their dog. It's the same concept. You have levels. We're going to figure out what level works for our dog. And then we're going to go through collar conditioning, which is week two. So again, we're working on our collar conditioning for two days. We're saying sit. We're every third or fourth time we are pushing the button as we give the command. You will notice the dog will start sitting faster because the dog thinks that the faster they sit, they can avoid this correction. Just like with the pinch collar, they're trying to avoid a correction or a negative. Then we're going to work on heel, having the dog walk at heel during this time, during these first two days, telling them heel, good dog. If they get out too far, heel and pull, pull back and, and, and push the button on the collar. Then we're going to work on here. We're going to remote sit the dog. This would be on day three and four of this week. You're going to remote sit the dog, call the dog to you, pull on the collar as you, as you use the correction. Because again, we want them to understand that going toward you is how they turn the collar off, pull them toward you, tell them here. And then finally we'll use kennel where we will sit them in front of the kennel, tell them to kennel and, uh, and give them a correction every couple of times when they go into the kennel. So again, this is week two. We're working with these all kind of during this week. I start with sit, I then start to include heel, I then start to include here, and then I finally start to include kennel. We work on all of these commands every three or four times the dog is corrected. Your first day you go out, you might only use the collar three or four times. The subsequent days you're gonna use it more. And then toward the end of week two is when we are going to start giving commands and not giving corrections and overall just giving a ton of praise. Again, the dog thinks that they're going to get corrected if they don't, uh, if they don't act quickly, they are going to start doing it automatically. And then as we work into week three, we're going to be off lead. So now we'll talk about week three. Now, week three is your final week in the obedience course that I offer here. And it is where I have the dog. We are walking with a leash on. We're giving commands, but we're not giving a correction every third or fourth time because it's not conditioning them to act quickly. They think they're going to get corrected if they don't do it. And after, on the first day or the second day, I'll actually drop the leash. I do leave a leash on them because you want to be able to have control if they decide they're not going to come toward you because you can always step on the leash if it's on the ground being drug. But you're going to put them in a position so that they understand they just have to listen. There are times when we'll have to re-grab the leash and work with them on commands to reassure them this is what we want with praise. It's also using negative but we're going to start doing these commands off lead and you will see a huge difference in the dog. Dogs are adverse to pressure. They don't want pressure. You will see that they have this attitudinal issue where they think, oh my gosh, this is terrible. But once they realize, once you get them to the point where they're like, holy cow, I don't get corrected as long as I do this, at that point you've won. The dog then is going to be completely compliant you are going to work with them off lead with, again, letting the leash drag, and you're going to give them commands and they're going to heal next to you. They're going to sit next to you. They're going to come to you and use a command here, and they're going to go in the kennel when you give a command to kennel. You get to the end of week three. From there, what I instruct people is the dog's always going to listen to me as the trainer. You need to take over and you need to have the same standards and work with them at least once a day and continue this work. Again, once we get past week into week three, uh, past week three, then we're using the collar for correction only. This is for non-compliance. We get into that if you go to different areas and the dog decides they think they can get away, quote unquote, get away with things, just use the collar a lot. I tell my clients, use the collar a lot and you won't have to use the collar a lot in the future. With that thought being, if you use the collar over and over for non-compliance, the dog eventually is always going to be compliant because they want that praise. Keep your praise at 90% positive, 10% negative praise, because that will help you modify the dog's behavior and get them to listen. 
So I hope that helps. I hope that is something that will help you in our training. We do take at least two to three dogs per month here at Saki Acres Retrievers during uh, different months of the year. So if there's ever anything I can help you with and you'd like to put your dog with us, please contact us. Go to our website, SakiAcres.com. You can call me 262-215-9683 or email me, SportingDogTV at gmail.com. That's it for this part of the show. Next up, I want to talk about a fun upland hunt I had with my sons, Clayton and Cal, out in Kansas. All that and more coming up after this. If you love the shooting sports like I do, you need to check out our friends at Mac Outdoors. They have fantastic products whether you're looking at shot shell or metallic reloading, or you want to get yourself a clay thrower so you can practice up for the season. For more information, check out their website at MacOutdoors.com. Hey, welcome to the last part of the show. The last part of our show is always a hunting story or hunting tip. And today I wanted to talk about a fun hunt I went on with my sons, Clayton and Callahan, when we were filming our TV show. It was season eight of Sporting Dog Adventures filming. And it was something that I hold dear to my heart now because it is an HD home video of one of my sons that I've lost. Um, if you didn't hear uh, at the end of this uh, January of this year, uh, Callahan was in a car accident. It has been something I'm trying to deal with as I walk through things. I realize I talk about my loss a lot. I kind of feel like it's my mission to help people realize the value of time. And with Cole, it was to realize the value of not only time, but mental health. It, it is a difficult thing to talk about for me now. I have nine seasons of the show that I can watch. I watched a couple of the episodes uh, with my son, Clayton. It's something that you'd think it wouldn't be hard, but everyone deals with grief differently. I, as of right now, can't really even watch my own TV show just because of having to still deal with the loss of Cal. But at the same time, I know I have great memories that I'm gonna cherish, and this was one of them. Uh, we went to Kansas. We were sponsored by the Kansas Department of Tourism. We went to a, uh, a guide service called Flint Hills in Kansas and it was a fun hunt. We went out, um, Cal was shooting. He was, uh, he was younger. I think he was probably 13 at the time. And it was fun because he was now able to be part of the show where we were shooting at birds. And it, he didn't disappoint. That kid, birds would go up and I'd watch him come down and I was like, holy cow, he actually can hit stuff. Unlike Clayton, which if Clayton, if you're listening to the show, you couldn't hit anything until you're about 15, but Cal was really a good shot. He, uh, he shot a bunch of big roosters. Uh, he, uh, he had a lot of fun. He's got a lot of character. He would, he would, uh, take a shot, shoot, and take the bird, his gun down, say dead bird. And it was funny because one time he actually didn't have a dead bird and missed. And I'm like, yeah, getting cocky, aren't you buddy? Uh, but overall, he had a lot of great shots. It was fun as you're watching him go from being a child to a teenager to eventually a man. And to see this transition as a hunting family, to see him in the field, uh, something which I always had to make sure my kids had not only safety down, but I put a camera guy with them, tight with them, because I worry about just overall safety when you're hunting upland. To me, it's one of the most dangerous things you can do because you're walking with a gun, you're excited, there's birds, there's other people, there's camera guys, there's guides, there's so much going on that you want to make sure that they are keeping all of this in mind. And he looked like a seasoned pro. He was safer and a better shot than most adults that I've hunted with. It was a neat lodge. They had great food. Callahan would consistently find whatever the most expensive uh, item on the menu was, which was elk tenderloin. And he would order that to which I'm just like, Cal, we don't have to get the most expensive thing every time. But the lodge was very gracious in telling us that it wasn't a problem, that, you know, they, they appreciated us coming out there to hunt. 
And overall, it was it, it's something that I can look back on and I can see this gawky, skinny, tall uh, young man out there just making his dad proud. So again, if you can learn anything from me in my life, it's that no matter how much success you have, we can't buy time. Take a minute, give your kids a hug, contact them, have a conversation with them, spend some time. You won't regret it. Trust me. <clears throat> so <clears throat> that, uh, that's it for this week's show. I do want to thank everyone for watching our show. I know we are at about a week and a half since the last episode. Doing the best I can as I navigate through this stuff to keep updated shows. But please check in next week with us. We'll have a great episode coming up. And go back and listen to some of our past episodes. We have so much information from a gun dog training program to fun hunts and tips for hunting and training. All in our past episodes of the Sporting Dog Adventures podcast. Again, thank you so much for listening. Have a great week and God bless. Sporting Dog Adventures, run, boy, run. Everything you need is here under the sun.